the second Sunday of Advent, the theme is prepare the way. We see this with, uh, in particular, John the Baptist, who is calling, prepare the way of the Lord. He's the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Advent is the season of preparation. We are preparing for the coming of Christ. And as we've talked about, it is not preparing ourselves for Christmas. It is not preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ 2,000 years ago, but it's the preparation of Christ's second coming. The second coming of Christ, I know, is never a topic of conversation at a cocktail party with Episcopalians, <laughs> right? This is not on our agenda. In fact, we just kind of avoid it. I mean, we love Advent, right? We love the carols, and we certainly love Christmas. Uh, but we just often, I think, let's be honest, kind of glaze over some of the readings that are happening this time of year. But the readings are very clear. This is a time of preparation for the coming of Christ. Now, I think one of the reasons that we really avoid this topic is because our uh, public conversation is dominated by a religious viewpoint that is held by a very small minority group of Christians in the world. And it is this. It's basically every Bruce Willis movie. It will all come to a violent end, right? The world will blow up and it will all end. That's what we know about the apocalypse. And in fact, that viewpoint has so dominated the culture that it has been picked up by Hollywood, and it is a kind of an example of religion infu in, uh, infusing itself into the public square. But this viewpoint of the second coming of Christ is about 100 to 125 years old. If you talk to a theologian outside of the United States, they will always, when this subject comes up, says this is a uniquely American problem and a uniquely American viewpoint. It's not one held by the majority of Christians around the world. It is certainly not part of our Anglican tradition, our Episcopal tradition. It is not the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. It is not the tradition of the Eastern Orthodox Church. The tradition amongst the great majority of Christians, is that Christ's second coming is already happening. It's in process. And Christ is not coming to destroy the world. Because that idea violates a promise God makes in the book of Genesis. Right? After the story of Noah, God promises never to destroy the earth again. So any theological uh, idea that calls for that actually is violating Scripture and is violating a very clear promise from God to never destroy the earth. And yet I think that it is a, an idea that uh, some folks uh, find a very enticing. It falls in line with a more Calvinist, I promise you I'm not going to dive too deep into this, you're not going to get a a seminary lecture this morning, but the idea of a very hardcore Calvinist viewpoint that some are chosen, the rest are damned. And my problem with that viewpoint is I think that is the worst version of a parent. Could you imagine someone coming up to you and saying, we knew from the very beginning that our oldest was just going to be nothing but trouble. And really, we just wrote them off. We wrote that child off the minute they started crying the first day we brought them home. But the younger child, we knew that one. Oh, that was our special child. And that one's going to be fine. Right? You would be stunned. You'd have no response for that. But why are we not stunned by a theological idea that says that? That God, the Creator, looks out and goes, some of you are going to make it, 
the rest of you have no shot. Where's the free will in that? And what's the point? This idea has so pervaded the culture that in recent years, more than once, it has been reported kind of in the religious news section of a Congress, a member of Congress, saying that we don't need to care for the earth, that we don't need to worry about uh, weapons, we don't need to address social ills, because this is God's promise to us, the world is going to culminate in, apocalyptic, uh, in an apocalypse and all end, literally go to hell in a handbasket. And so there's no point in us trying to do any good. Where's the hope? Where's the joy? What kind of creator does that? The good news, my friends, is we don't believe that. The good news is the majority of Christianity doesn't believe that. The good news is that for 2,000 years, the Christian church has affirmed a different viewpoint. Christ is coming, right? We say that in one of our Eucharistic prayers. It's a response we all say. Christ is coming. It is happening now. And in Isaiah, Luke leaves out a part of Scripture, not on purpose, but it's because he didn't, he didn't have this in his translation. In the Greek translation of the Jewish Bible that he would have used, he quotes at the end of Isaiah, this part from Isaiah, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. But the original text says all flesh as one shall see the salvation of God. What the Scriptures promise us is that we will all see God as one. And until we all see God as one, Christ is coming. The good news is Christ is already amongst us. Christ is here. But the great call from John the Baptist is for us to continue to prepare the way for God. So our, our positions when we work on public policy in the square should be to improve the planet, should be to improve our nation, should be to improve our cities and counties and the places where we live, to live into God's promise that he says over and over again in the scriptures that he has come to renew the earth, not to destroy it. The great question for us when we walk into the voting booth is who is about renewing this community? Who is living into the promise of hope for this community? That cuts beyond party. Whatever your party affiliation is or not affiliation is, call our public officials to that great hope. Call yourselves to that great hope. This time of preparation is where we look and examine our lives and look at the ways in which they don't align with Christ. Because the other theme through all this is repentance. But repentance means a making an amendment in your life, turning away from the things that draw us away from God and from neighbor. Repentance isn't about beating ourselves up. The only beings that have a hard time with forgiveness are the human beings, not the divine. God is quick to forgive. But so often we are unable to accept it. And I think because we're afraid to really examine ourselves. So what I want to encourage you is this. Really take some time this week in prayer and in thought and examine your life. What are those burdens that you've been carrying? What are those areas of your life that you know need to change, but you've been beating yourself up over them? And I am here to tell you that God doesn't want you to beat yourself up over them anymore. Lay them at the feet of Jesus. 
and he is quick to forgive. And when you ask for forgiveness, be assured that you are forgiven, that you no longer need to carry those burdens with you anymore. In the Episcopal Church, we have seven sacraments. One of those is uh, penitence. Now, almost nobody takes me up on this offer, ever, because everyone says, I can, there is no way I'm going to go to the priest and confess all my sins. And I don't think that that's really necessary. We have general confession every Sunday, and that covers it. But I'll tell you when you may need to call me, is when you are finding it difficult to accept forgiveness. When you can't accept forgiveness, that is a good time to call your minister and for us to sit down and have a conversation in complete confidence and quiet, as we say, under the stole. It never leaves my mind. Here's the great thing about most clergy. We don't remember what you confess to us. And the way that I found out that you think we do is that I've had people come to me and say, you know, last time when we met, I said such and such and such and such. I don't remember it. Because when I declare your forgiveness, it's time to forget it. If you are struggling with that, feel free to give me a call. And I'd love to sit down with you. And maybe you just need to hear out loud one-on-one that you are forgiven, that Christ is coming, that Christ is here amongst us, and we do not stand under judgment, but we stand under a God of hope and of love. I shared this last week, and at this point in the service, I want to share it now. Dear Lord, we have been told to prepare, but what do we do to prepare? We know you are coming in some special way, but God, we are busy. There are cards to send, decorations to hang, gifts to buy, and parties to attend. And if you came now, you would find no rest, homes full with the hustle and bustle of Christmas. You would find angry shoppers queuing motorists stuck in traffic jams. If you came now, you would find an if-only world. If only I'd prepared, if only I'd listened to all those sermons and prayers, if only I'd cared, but I suspect that we'd be too late. Lord, help us to prepare for your coming, to realize that you came into our world in order that we might enter yours. Help us to put our lives in order. Help us to put aside the trivial for the real things in life. Lord, prepare us for the spirit of Christmas during the season of Advent. For you are coming, whether we are ready or not. Help us to be ready.